Well, uh, welcome everyone to a chilly morning in the scrub. I'm here at Archbold Biological Station, and I, I just checked the temperature. It's about 56 degrees Fahrenheit here. Now, if you're in Florida, you're thinking, oh goodness, that's really cold. If you're tuning in from New York or some other place, maybe you're thinking, that sounds pretty good because it's freezing where I am right now. Uh, but in winter here in Florida, 56 degrees is pretty chilly. Now, where am I? What kind of habitat is this? I'm looking around and I'm noticing this white sand behind me here. And I'm seeing uh, different kinds of palmettos around me and little oak trees. That tells me I'm in the Florida scrub. And those of you who have watched this before, that's usually the habitat that I'm coming from, the Florida scrub. So I see that white sand. And I also have this special kind of palmetto next to me here, which is called a scrub palmetto. And you see these little strings it has that come off of it, little palmetto fibers. That's one of the way, reasons I know this is called a scrub palmetto because it has those little strings off of those. And those are nice and soft. So the Florida scrub jay, when it's making its nest and the oak trees around here, it will put that um, nice soft material in there and then lay its eggs and it's, um, their babies will have a nice little soft place to live. So the reason that I'm pointing out these different characteristics of being in this habitat is because I'm going to take a little short walk here and move into another habitat. And what I have to walk through is called an ecotone. And that's something I haven't brought up before in any of these. So what does that mean, an ecotone? Well, that first part of the word eco, that might sound familiar because you may have heard ecosystem before. Now, eco goes way back to ancient Greece. And the word it used to be back then was oikos. Those of you who like to eat yogurt might know the oikos Greek yogurt brand. And what oikos means is home. So eco is home. And we're going to go through an ecotone, which is the transition, the spot where two different habitats go right next to each other. And it's pretty interesting because it's a spot that has more diversity of life than either of those two habitats because you have plants and animals from both habitats in the same place. Um, so I'm gonna just start walking here. And when you're out in Florida, one thing you notice is you don't see any mountains, you don't usually see any hills, but with just slight changes in elevation, a foot, just a few feet, you can move from one habitat to another one. Now, right now, I just walked just a tiny bit and I am in the ecotone. Because if I look around, I can still see plants that you find in the Florida scrub. Right here, this is uh, a blueberry. This is a shiny blueberry right here. And that's something I would find in the Florida scrub. But I'm also starting to notice grasses popping up behind me. And I'm seeing this is a plant that loves water here called a St. John's wort. So now I'm in this transition ecotone where both of these worlds are colliding right here and I'm just going to keep walking a little bit further. I'm also noticing that that sand is starting to disappear and now what I have is actual soil. I have organic soil under my feet because plants here they get wet, they die, their bodies start to turn into mud, start to turn into soil. And now as I'm walking, 
I am totally inside of a, a wetland. Now, you might be thinking, where is the water? Well, here in Florida, a lot of times, uh, if you come out during this part of the year, which is the dry season, you can go through an area that's the scientists, you know, the scientists will call it a wetland, and it's dry because we have a dry part of the year and a wet part of the year. But I do see a spot over here that has, uh, looks a little bit wet. So I'm gonna go check it out here. <laughs> There's no standing water, but you can see that it looks muddy. Definitely looks muddy here. And there's one, I do see one uh, plant that I'll, I'll put my macro lens on and show you. That is a, a, that's a pink sundew. And this is, I always get excited when I find these because they're, it's a carnivorous plant. It's really small. It's only about this big. And uh, let's turn this around. And I'll get down close with my macro lens. And you can see, see the pink there. Oh, there it is. All those little droplets that look like water, th that's not water. Those little droplets, um, it's actually like a glue. So an insect will land on that and get stuck. And then the plant will uh, eat the insect, will dissolve the insect and eat it, which is pretty cool. Okay, I'll turn this back around. So there we go. We just walked down a hill, even though if you were here, you would probably not think it was a hill. But we went down, I'm not sure, maybe two feet, something like that, in elevation, down this little hill. And because it's a little lower, the rainwater will gather up here. Um, and some areas are, become these wetter um, little wetlands. And even when they're dry, we can still look at the plants that are there and tell that, oh, those are, those are plants that like wet areas. Okay, it's time for our first guest. So Vivian Slaughter is going to come on and talk a little bit about her job here. So Vivian, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Dustin. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. So I'm Vivian Slaughter. I'm the Director of Data and Technology at Archbold, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about GIS. So what is GIS? Uh, it is a Geographic Information System. That is what it stands for, which is a little confusing. So let's break that down. GIS is a system that creates, manages, analyzes, and most importantly, maps all types of data. GIS connects data to a map by bringing in the location, so where things are, with all types of descriptive information, so what things are like there. GIS allows us to understand patterns and relationships based on where things are. Let's take a look at all of the ways that Archbold uses GIS. The first way is by using GPS units, and so those um, can take a high accuracy track of location of where you are in the field. And so we'll use that to document all sorts of things. Here we can see um, an example of a gopher tortoise. And in our herpetology lab, they use a GPS unit, the Trimble device, to track where the tortoises are um, at any time. And they use it for a variety of other things as well, as you can see in this quote here, maybe nests or vegetation surveys. Um, or where exotics are that require management or anything that they really need to know the precise, precise location of. We also use apps. There are GIS apps, and those are used to navigate, collect data, and share information in the field. So you could have a crew of people out in the field trying to collect some data on, um, in this example, a grasshopper sparrow. Um, and you would be able to see where the other people in the field are. You would see where um, you needed to navigate to in the field. Um, and then you could have a little drop down form that would show you what, uh, you know, make it easy for you to collect data while you're out in the field in this app on your phone or tablet. We also use UAVs or drones. Um, 
In this example, drones are used to capture images after a prescribed fire. So you can see the picture here um, is showing the extent of the fire, where things burned. You can see this, this dark area. And prescribed fires are used a lot um, in research that we do at Archbold. And uh, it's really important for us to track where they happened and how hot the fire was while it was there, or the severity. Spatial analysis is another way that we use GIS. And so this is the process of extracting or creating new information to understand how things are distributed in space. So spatial an analysis helps us answer the question of where. So for example, we're able to identify how far away a certain habitat type is from a lower lying wetland. So in Dustin being out in the field there today, um, we're able to say how far was that scrub habitat that he was in to that wetland area that he was in. Um, so how wide is that ecotone area or that hill that he was going down? And we can also look and see what the elevation is. And so we can actually tell that it is a hill, even though it might not look like one when you're out in the field. Um, another example is trying to find the busiest roadway that a bear might try and cross so that we can look to see what type of wildlife crossing should be put in those places. And finally, cartography. And cartography is the science and art of making maps. And you can see here, there are a variety of different maps um, that we can see. Uh, the Lake Annie um, over here, if you can see where my mouse is. Um, here's some elevation data around the station. Um, some, the Lake Wales Ridge, the elevation of the Lake Wales Ridge um, all through here. Um, and here we have the Florida Wildlife Corridor map. Um, which shows where areas that uh, wildlife needs to be conserved so that they can move through. And we will hear a little bit more about that from um, Angeline later in the session today. That's it from me. Back over to you, Dustin. Thank you, Vivian. Very cool. While, uh, while Vivian was giving her presentation, I went for a little walk. I wanted to find you another seasonal pond maybe looked a little different, maybe had a little bit of water on it. And so I came to an interesting one here. And you can see, still right here, you're not seeing a lot of water, but you are seeing these pine trees. I'm going to talk about those in a minute. Um, but actually, I'll flip my camera around so you can get the same view I have. Here we go. I'm going to lower this down. So what's on the ground all around me here is sphagnum moss. And that's kind of covering like a blanket, everything. But notice there's these little burrows. And as you look around, they're everywhere. I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Um, I ran out pretty quickly. So are those burrows? Are they um, from, are some, some of them maybe are just tracks from a big animal walking through. Oh, this one right here has some scat next to it. If I get down low, you can see there's some animal scat there. Looks maybe like a rabbit or something like that. As we go forward here, there's one of these holes. Oh, goodness. I'm so um, curious about these holes. Are they just animal tracks? Are they burrows? What are they? If we look out here, we can see there is some water out there. Pan this over. I'll put it a little bit higher so you can look down. Not quite the same view that Vivian gets with her drones. <laughs> but here you can see our pond that we're at. And I'll turn the camera back around. And you can see me, oops, and you can see me again. There I am. Pretty cool. You know, I've been, I've walked through here many times, but I've never actually come exploring and investigating in this part of the pond. And um, it's amazing. You can, you can go to the same natural area over and over again for years and still see things that you notice things that you never noticed before. Let's talk a little bit about all these pine trees here. Because you might be kind of wondering, like, what is a pine tree doing inside of a pond? 
Maybe that seems kind of strange. Well, these are called slash pines and they do really well in the in wet areas. Pretty amazing. They um, they also do really well in hurricanes. They have these big, deep roots, big, deep tap roots that go way down. And uh, it's pretty hard for hurricanes to knock these over. So sometimes they do get knocked over, um, but most they're usually pretty good. They also can survive fires too. So if we get a little closer, oh, and look, here's, okay, here's a pine cone. It's one of their, they've got pretty large pine cones. Um, but let's get a little closer and look at the bark. This bark, if you were to describe it, I'd probably say um, it's flaky, <laughs> solid, just flaky, no, like that. Flaky is like right up if a fire comes through here. We have a lot of fires in the scrub. There's there's natural fires from lightning, um, but most of the fire that happens is because we have a team that comes out and does a prescribed burn about every ten years. And yeah, the fire will come up to these. Even though it's in a pond here, doesn't mean a fire can't get to it. Right now, it's the dry season. If, if a fire was here, it would go right through a lot of the ponds here. It would burn up all the, a lot of the vegetation in the ponds. So even ponds burn. But here's the thing. All these layers, all these little papery layers actually protect this. So the outside layers, they might char, they might burn a little bit. But the tree itself is protected underneath there. And when you look up, can you see how high those branches are? The flames are probably not going to reach those branches. Now, sometimes the lower branches will, uh, will die. And sometimes you'll see that a lot of the tree, the needles all look orange or yellow. But if they're still green at the top, after a fire has come through, it's probably fine. It's probably still alive. All right, well, I'm gonna keep walking around and see what else I can find out here. I know Angeline has a presentation too. So Angeline, are you there? I'm here, Dustin. So um, my name is Angeline Meeks and I am the conservation cartographer here at Archbold. And one of my main projects is the Florida Wildlife Corridor and the maps that I make for that. Um, before I talk to you about the maps. Um, I want to give you a little background on the corridor, um, but while we're going over that, you'll see some of the types of maps that I make. Um, so the corridor is a statewide network of nearly 18 million acres of land, and you can see here in this map, it stretches all the way from the very top corner of Florida in the Panhandle, and comes all the way down through the Everglades. So as of 2021, nearly 10 million acres um, have already been conserved, um, which means that they're protected from development. And you may not realize it, but you have probably been out into the corridor yourself before. Um, and that's because these protected areas and conserved lands are made up of many of our state parks that we love to visit, um, national parks, forests, um, state forests, wildlife management areas. And so this map shows you a few examples. Now, the rest of the area that you see here in this bright green color, these are areas that we still need to protect. Um, they are areas um, that we call opportunity areas. So they're, they're areas that um, you know, are potentially um, going to be developed one day. So we are hoping to conserve them and protect them as part of the wildlife corridor before that happens. And why do we wanna do that? Because Florida has amazing wildlife that we wanna protect. We wanna make sure that they have enough habitat and that that habitat is connected. Um, and so you can just see here some amazing photos um, that are from Carlton Ward Jr. and his camera trap photos that he has. 
And these are um, examples of the Florida black bear and the deer and bobcat and even a panther. Um, so these are some of the animals that use either large areas of the corridor or some like the panther only use smaller areas like here um, in the south part of the corridor. Um, so now I'll show you some of the types of maps that I make. Uh, for example, political maps. Now these are maps that we use to help um, you know, decision makers, whether it's at the county level or the state level, um, help them understand the corridor in their area. Now we also make maps for the press. And so these are examples that were used in newspaper articles. Um, sometimes that is um, maps that show the full corridor through the state. And then sometimes it shows just a small area of the corridor. And we make maps for social media. Um, so this map here that you'll see as I scroll up um, is for the Florida Wildlife Corridor expedition that happened recently called Spring to Shore. And this was a really special expedition because it featured a group of um, youth expedition leaders. Um, and it shows them here in this photo with some of the original Florida Wildlife Corridor um, explorers that went out and did these amazing expeditions um, and spent, you know, thousand days out in the corridor moving through the state. Um, so those videos, you can find them on YouTube and they're, they're just amazing. Uh, the youth expedition Spring to Shore will be coming out soon. So so keep your eye out for that. And this map shows their expedition from Rainbow Springs all the way out um, to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, some of our maps are interactive, like this one here. Um, it helps you find a place to explore in the corridor. Um, so for example, say you wanted to do some fishing in the corridor and maybe you wanted to, to go on a camping trip too. Um, so when you select those two activities, it then shows you places in the corridor that you can do both of those things. Um, for example, the Everglades, a great place to explore. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, Angeline, that was great. That was great. Yes. And everyone, keep in mind that she, um, Vivian and Angeline, will be back on in a few minutes to answer questions. So I know they just showed, both of them showed all kinds of amazing, um, amazing maps and talked about cool technologies. So they will be back on to answer your questions. And um, if you have questions, you can start putting them in the chat. If you're on, if you're on Zoom, you can put them in the Q&A section too. Well, I, uh, while Angeline was talking, I came wandering around and thought, ooh, let's see if I can look for a different kind of pine tree because I was just talking about the, the slash pine. So this other pine tree that is right here with me, this is called a sand pine. And if you're wondering where would you find a sand pine, the answer is in the name. It's found in sandy areas, which makes a lot of sense. So if I turn my camera around, you'll see I am back out in the Florida scrub again with all that white sand. And here we can find sand pines. I did hold up a slash pine pine cone a little earlier. Now let's take a look at the, the pine cones that you find on these trees. They're much smaller. Let's see how small this one is here. This is, this is the normal size. This is the normal size on these. And you notice um, there, I don't know if you can tell how spiky they are, but they're pretty spiky. They're kind of closed in, uh, holding onto their seeds. And the ones down here in this part of Florida where there's a lot of fire uh, have really closed pine cones like this. But if you went up to the, the Northern part of Florida over by the Panhandle or in another Southeastern state, they would be a little different. There's, there's, uh, they're a little more open there. So here they actually stay closed until a fire comes and then they open up with the heat of the fire, at least for most of their cones. 
I can see actually here's one cone that is partly open. This pine cone right here is is actually part partly open. Pretty cool. So it's called serotonous when you have the cones that stay closed until a fire comes. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about them is that even though um, they're they're been out here for thousands and thousands of years, they're pretty cool looking. They also smell really good. They can be used as Christmas trees. They also can become a problem because if there's not fire in an area, these trees will just end up everywhere. They'll just end up uh, taking over if you don't keep burning it. So the fire knocks them back because these are very different than the slash pine. When a fire comes through here, these light right up. And you can see their, their bark is a lot different looking than, than with the slash pine. So poof, they go up. You notice that the branches are low. The fire comes right through here. So two, two different pine trees, um, sometimes hanging out right near each other, but with very different relationships to fire. Okay, I'm going to look at the time here. I think it's about time, 9.58. So let's bring back our two guests and let's see uh, what kinds of questions people have for them. And I know that I saw there was a little bit, I didn't get to look, but there was a little bit of uh, stuff in the chat. So there was a Q&A question that came through. Um, Katie, can you help us out with our questions? Yes, so the first one we had um, was actually for you, Dustin, but is there a purpose for those little strings on the scrub palmetto? Does it do anything for the plant? I, I'm not aware of, of it having a specific purpose for the plant, um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't one. And even if other researchers haven't figured out why it has them, it doesn't mean that there isn't one. The strings are part of the frond. It's just the frond starting to fray. So it's not like a totally new thing that it has to make. Um, I'm not sure if, if our guests have any idea about that. Looking around, the, the ones that are around me are, are saw palmettos. So these ones don't have those strings. These ones don't. Mm. Um, do our guests know why the saw palmettos have those strings? No, I don't know either. Mm. I, I don't, but now I'm curious as well, and I'm going to look it up. <laughs> awesome. Sounds like a research project. <laughs> Alrighty, so for Angeline, did the citizens generally support the designation of opportunity areas to conservation areas, or is there a lot of resistance? Also, are conservation areas zoned or acquired by purchase? Great question. Um, I think that, of course, everyone has a, a different, you know, opinion on, on how land should be used in Florida, but I think overall there's been a lot of great support for the wildlife corridor and, and just land conservation in general. I think Florida is a state that really stands out for, um, for its, its wonderful history of, of land conservation. Um, and for how we go about conserving acres, there's different ways that that land can be protected. So some of that is acquired outright by, you know, the state um, or, or maybe a land trust or, or a local, say, water management district. But there's also opportunities um, for a conservation easement, which means something like a, a ranch could be continued to be um, owned by the family. It's just, um, you know, an entity like a, a land trust or the state would um, would kind of buy the rights to, to develop the land so they can continue to use the land naturally um, or for ranching, but it's just the, a way of ensuring that that land will not be um, developed in the future. Awesome. Dustin, I don't know if we want to give it another go on the sundew question. Um, it seemed like you heard me okay, but I'll repeat it real quick. Um, do the sundew droplets have an odor such as a pheromone to attract the insect or do they think it's water or do we even know? <laughs> um, so first I'll say here at Archbold, they've never studied that, but I, I've played around on Google Scholar looking on sundew stuff and I've seen some interesting things in other parts of the world. Yes, the sundew, I don't know if it's the droplets or what, but the sundew has a smell. Um, the sundew also 
does need to be pollinated by insects. And when it needs to do that, a stalk grows up the center of it above the rest, above all of those little droplets and a little tiny little flower is there. And then that has a smell. So some scientists have, have uh, speculated that maybe the sundew has different smells um, either to um, like to make, you know, the flower would smell different than the bottom part and that would attract different kinds of insects. Like the, like we want these insects to eat. We want these insects to pollinate us, but I think there's still a lot of mystery around it. So that looks like all we have for questions today. Um, and I think we are all good to go then. So thank you for joining us everyone today. Uh, and thank you, Angeline and Vivian, for coming on and um, joining us today. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Thanks, Katie. Of course. All righty. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs>